Uh, this is going to show you how we are able to help uh, large uh, service provider enterprise networks, all large networks, how to find problems, how to do verification, and how to find the needle in the haystack. So feel free to ask me questions, and I'll try to weave in as much as our experience as possible. So what we're showing you here is a network. Imagine that you know, you're working with Charles Schwab, and you have this complex network, and you deploy Veriflow software. Immediately, it adds value. It gives you not only a map of the network, but also the health of the network. There's a lot of things it's going to check automatically, although you can interact with the system and find more things. So, and you, you can imagine not only it has given you a map of the network, but it has found issues right away on first day of deployment. Okay. And I'm going to show you different snapshots that we'll show here of as we make progress. Now we have deployed in operations. You know, are there issues in operations? We have made changes. Are those changes causing any problems or not? We will show you the examples of that. So to clarify, are you saying out of the box there's some intense defined already that you'll catch, you'll catch interesting things within the network? Absolutely. Okay. This is what Brighton mentioned, auto-inference okay. of intents. There are, there are millions of checks we are going to make automatically without user interaction. Got it. However, you will see that users will enjoy interacting with the system because of the richness of our, uh, uh, our library and uh, our uh, search capabilities as well as the APIs that you can in use it to integrate. Cool. Okay, so uh, what you see here is a network, and uh, I'm going to show you what's in this network. In the middle, we have Backbone. Uh, on the right, we have um, uh, you know a cloud instance that uh, Brighton is going to talk about later. Uh, then we have a site in Dallas, a site in New York. Uh, we have a primary data center with its own DMZ. We have a redundant data center with its own DMZ, and I have a few routers that reflect uh, the internet. So I'm going to focus on uh, you know, certain areas here. As you zoom in, you get more and more dynamic information from the network. Okay? You can see IP addresses, you can see firewalls, uh, whether something is a, a trunk or a tunnel. You get all of this information dynamically. Now imagine a large customer who is trying to do this using Visio diagram. The moment they print that diagram, it's obsolete because the network changes so fast. And because they are doing things manually, they can make huge mistakes in the diagrams. While this is uh, coming directly from the network dynamically. And by the way, if you're looking at a certain view, you can essentially share that link as a URL to one of your colleagues across the country, and they can be looking at exactly the same thing. Okay? So uh, that's the powerful uh, information that's available in the system that can be shared and used for operational purposes across the organization. Okay. Uh, so not only we know the physical topology and the physical connectivity of the network based upon the information that we have collected, we know the functional behavior of the network. Okay? And I will show you quite a few examples of that. Okay? But imagine you deployed this in a large environment, and you want to know what the health of the network is. So we provide these useful dashboards. Okay? And I'm going to explain two dashboards here. The first dashboard tells you the overall health of the network. On top, you see a summary of checks that we have made. On the right, these are automated checks. In the middle, these are user-generated checks. Okay? Automated checks are what system has checked by, you know, by itself, on its own. And to do so, it has inferred many things about the network. Okay? For example, it has inferred what are the access layers, what are the core layer devices, what are pairs of devices in, in a redundant fashion, and it has automatically identified that information. So it tells you the health of the network right there. Okay. Second thing you see is a bunch of statistics about the network. How many devices are there? How many routes are there? How many access lists are there? 
and, uh, and so on. And the device layers that I was talking about, they're right here in the middle. So if you had you know, 2,000 devices, network devices in your data center yesterday, and today you have 2,001 devices, you want to know where that one device came from. Okay, it's important. And actually later on when Brighton presents his demo, he's going to show you the diff between today, yesterday and today to show you that there was, there was one device added. But you can see some of that here as well. Then at the bottom, you see a bunch of health checks. Okay. These are based upon industry best practices. Okay. And these health checks include uh, loop checks, uh, MTU mismatches, uh, you know, VLAN mismatches across the trunk port, CPU utilization, memory utilization, and so on. And we combine the results of that and give you an overall health score of the data center. So we had a large customer who said that, hey, cut all that complexity and tell me, is my data center resilient or not? We sat down with them and we said, OK, let's agree on what's important to you. And we put all of that together in this dashboard. This is based upon a very important customer experience for us. And, and we have validated this with many customers in different verticals. They have all agreed, yes, this is important information we want to see. However, remember we said we have APIs. You can take this and integrate it with any fancy NOC dashboard that you have, take pieces of it, take the whole thing, and make it part of your existing operations processes. Okay. Um, so I just wanted to highlight, this may look like you know hundreds or thousands of checks. But keep in mind, behind each check is actually thousands or millions of checks. I'll give you a simple example. So one of the customers we're working with, uh, in one data center, they had 1,500 network devices. And they had 100,000 interfaces. So one check we have is an MTU check, MTU mismatch check. Imagine you ask an engineer, hey, go check MTU on all ports and make sure it's matching. The guy may come back with an answer after a month. And by that time, the network has changed. Okay? So this has gone out and checked all interfaces, the MTUs on them found out which interfaces are connected to each other, compared the MTU, and given you a result. And it tells you exactly where the mismatch is. Okay. The second dashboard that I'm going to show you is the resilience dashboard. Again, is my data center resilient? Is my backbone resilient? You ask that question, there are many aspects of that. What we showed you in the previous dashboards are many of the what we call device config or protocol state checks. What you see here are a lot of flow consistency checks, the behavior of the network, not just in one device, but end to end, across a layer, uh, east-west traffic, north-south traffic. So we are checking for consistency of flows and consistency of access lists, as an example. You may have pairs of devices. If one fails, the other one takes over. Okay. One of our customers said, hey, I found that in one, one of my devices I had 100 access lists. In another one, I had 99. Okay. How can you check that automatically? You know, so here is a system that does that for you. Because if that 100 access list device fails and the second device takes over, it's not giving you the same level of security. So that inconsistency we will check. By the way, I'm going to give you some examples in the network. I'm, right now, I'm just telling you the dashboards where you get the summary view. But I'm going to give you these examples more specifically in the network. Same thing in the middle, you see reachability and multipath checks. Okay. Is there north, south, and east-west reachability or not? This is all inferred. We found what the access layers are, what should be the north-south traffic based upon what are the subnets configured on your uh, uh, HSRP pairs. Okay. Same thing, do you have multipath or not? We do a lot of protocol state checks, like HSRP check. We know these are HSRP pairs. One should be master, one should be backup. If something happens between them and there's a communication issue, they both claim to be masters. That's not a good state to have, please. Okay, so how do customers respond to that sort of thing? Because in, in my experience, we wind up with customers who have half configured HSRP because that other router is going to be installed next month. Absolutely. Or they had an old config which is left there. So, yeah, we went to a customer, we installed this, they found out HSRP was configured fine. 
but they were missing an OSPF entry for one of the subnets to advertise that to the rest of the network. Mm -hmm. They thought they had a redundant path. To update this backup device, they brought down, as part of the plan, change window, they brought down the primary device to say, hey, I'm going to make changes now. And the service went down. Mm -hmm. Okay. So yes, uh, this opened up their eyes. We installed this. We found this problem right away. Not just this. I'm going to give you some very specific example of how do you then take that problem and find the needle in the haystack, the root cause of the issue. You know? So we'll, we'll go through that. Well, the, pro the problem that these customers had was not that it was a problem. It's just that it was a non-problem, and yet it showed up as a problem that they had to report up the chain of command. I'll give you an example of a non-problem. And, non and they said, no, this is not a problem. This is the way our network is intended to be right now. Which is great. Sometimes that's the way it is. But let's say that guy who was planning that way left, and six months later, a new guy comes in and makes a change, not knowing what the intent was. He's going to screw things up. Mm -hmm. So even if that was the intent, you want it to be documented that, hey, this is how it was. And now we're going to make a change based upon that. So understanding that behavior is still important. I'll give you an example of another non-intent. We went to a customer, and uh, one of the, the, the checks that uh, uh, we do, actually, you'll see it down here, uh, how long devices have been up. We found out out of the 1,500 devices in their data center, they had 32 devices which were up for 10 years. OK, no problem. And the, the operations engineer was actually pretty happy that, hey, I got good devices. They have been up for 10 years. These, these are solid <laughs> things. His, his boss wasn't happy because they had a policy that said, every year you're going to upgrade the software to make sure that you get rid of the bugs. Okay, so he said, hey, you haven't updated these devices in 10 years. These devices contain bugs from all of those last 10 years. So it's a perspective. Our goal is to give you that power and, and the information and, and, and a system to help you do a better job. Okay? Uh, another thing we are checking, not only we are checking state of HSRP and spanning tree, but also cross-protocol checks. It's a very good practice to have that wh whoever becomes the HSRP master should also be the spanning tree root. Okay. We will check for that consistency. And whenever there's a violation, we'll tell you. A quick question. Priority can, is can you override the internal checks you've pre-built? Yes, we okay. can. If, so uh, there's, there's also, you know, uh, when you're installing this, there are flags you can turn on and off. Uh, but you'll find that uh, all of these checks are fairly useful. Uh, but th if you if things need to be ignored, they can be ignored. Question about the uh, HSRP check. The other one that I've seen in the field is people have a static route in the vicinity of a firewall, and they point it at the real address of one of the routers rather than the virtual IP of the HSRP. Do you check that? We would know that a static route is sending a traffic in a certain way, yes. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you can define those checks yourself as well. But let me show you some of the examples in the demo. I think you'll get the idea of what I'm talking about. Cool. OK. Now I'm going to go into the Network Explorer. Now, I want you to know that we are not just checking configuration and protocol state. We know the end-to-end -end behavior of the network. I'm going to show you more search capability later. But I just want to show you one search right now just so you get the idea. How do you build a networking graph? Uh, the network graph is built based upon um, the not just the config, but also the CDP and LLDP information that we get. And if I don't run any? <laughs> yes, so we have some customers who actually intentionally block it. Uh, we have two ways of handling it. One is, of course, it can be manually entered, that what is connected to what. Second is we can glean information from MAC table and ARP table and build most of the graph that way. Yes. Okay, so I, I'm using a uh, you know pretty standard PCAP language uh, search query here, and hopefully no typo. It's asking a question, how does one go from New York to internet? Okay. 
And you can see here, it's found the path. In one click, I know where the path is. That's the power of it. If I had multiple paths, it'll tell me multiple paths. Okay. And there is a reason why I'm showing you this query. This is my ISP1 connection. When ISP1 fails, my traffic will switch over to ISP2. And I'll show you in my second snapshot the same query that the disaster recovery is working. Okay. That's a very important thing. Many customers told us, and this happened to one, of one major airline uh, a few months ago, they had, a, they had a problem in their primary data center. They switched over to the disaster recovery site. The router did not do what they expected it to do. They had never tested it. Okay. Yes. In the CMP case, I might take any of the paths that have actual cost to the destination. Would I know which path is exactly taken? Could you infer from data flow how hashing actually worked on the device in question? You know, what we will do is we'll show you all four possible paths. Uh, and uh, right now, we are not doing a check on the hashing itself. But as Brighton said, our model can do all of that check. You know, okay. that's an extension we can easily make. But we'll show you all possible paths. Okay? Now, so you understand that our system knows the behavior of the network. I'm going to, so let's say we made some changes in the network. I'm going to switch to a different snapshot, and a day later, and it's going to find, are there any problems in the network? And there I will pinpoint some of the problems to give you as examples. So as it's loading the second snapshot, the problems can be changes made by the user's problem can be things happening in the network, like ports going down or so on. I've simulated some stuff ahead of time to show you the value uh, so that you can see. OK, one of the things, the HSRP check we were telling. Uh, so reachability problem. So I know in my dashboard, I saw that I have some reachability issue. So I, I come to reachability, and I pick one of these errors that it's highlighting here. On the left side, it shows you the intents. Okay. And uh, this one. OK. Now, what this is saying is that, hey, I have these two HSRP pairs. I have access only to one of them, not the other. Okay. Now, because I built the demo, I know where the root cause is. But let me tell you how an operations person who is overwhelmed by the network itself now has to figure out you know, where the problem is. So what we have is a very detailed path trace panel. Okay? You can look at the flows in detail. Okay? This is like trace route on steroids. It tells you, unfortunately I can't zoom in, but it tells you exactly how the packet started what the IP address, MAC address, which port it came in. So it's not just a layer three analysis. It's physical, logical, uh, you know, layer one through four analysis. It tells you how it's starting, which access list is hitting, then where it goes out, how it's reaching out to the other uh, devices. Okay. Okay. And just to be precise, yes. you're showing what you think would have happened based on the snapshot of the state in the network. Based upon the data plane state that yeah. collected up. It's, it's, it's not that the packet is actually would behave like this. This is what you believe would happen based on the state you captured. Yes, yes because those are the forwarding entries in the packet. In, yeah, uh, and the uh, if the there device. is something uh, messy going on underneath the forwarding table that you don't see, like DMVPN redirects, then the packets would actually go some other way. So all the protocols that we support, mm -hmm. we will be able to know the behavior. Okay. If, yeah, if there's a protocol we don't support yet, you won't see it. But DMVPN, MPLS, OSPF, you know, anything that has created that routing table, we will see that. Yes, if there is a bug in the chip, we won't see it. Yeah. Okay. However, the majority of the problems are either the config was wrong, or there was misconnection, some port went down. We will catch all of them. Mm -hmm. It would be great to validate the model with some actual uh, net flows as flow traffic maybe to verify if the model, the traffic you really have on the network is the one that you expect on your model. Oh, that, like, would, be, that would be awesome. 
Yeah. <laughs> you need reinforcement yeah. in any uh, learning, right? You take the net flow data, you yeah. map that into your microflows, and then you see whether you, you, you cache the paths so the checks are fast. You know, Otherwise, you are stateless and you keep on learning on the same thing. Yeah. yeah. So, so by the way, that I'll would be really cool. And you could immediately pop an alert saying, hey, does this, does this net, net flow thingy reporting traffic that shouldn't be here? Yeah. yeah. So, so let me tell you a very important thing. Our system has determined all of this based upon the state using the mathematical model and, and the formal verification. We did not capture traffic to find out what's going wrong. We did not send any simulated traffic to find out what may happen. However, there is a very powerful integration capability. You can integrate with other systems that say, hey, something is changing in the network. Can you verify? And we'll verify. You can also integrate the other way that says, hey, my policy said this is a violation. Here is a flow analytics tool. That tool can be automatically told to check for uh, what, what, what other analysis can be, like what you're saying. Hey, tell me, send a flow, and then see what happens. So there are other tools out there that do that. We can integrate with them. OK, so you can see. So now here, I can uh, uh, you know, click on the source data. And I know, if you notice, I have two connections or two paths for every route. Except for this one, I only have one path. That tells me that I am not getting that route in my routing table. This is why my. My HSRP device, only one device is accessible, not the other device. All the other networks have two entries. Okay, this is 10 to 20, 10 to 30, 10 to 50, but 10 to 10 has one path. Okay. In the interest of time, I'm so I've shown you one auto-generated. This was an auto-generated check. User didn't have to do anything. I'm going to now show you a user-generated check, okay, which is a segmentation. So this is more related to now uh, you know, security aspects rather than just reachability. So I have an intent that I can define here, okay, which is, hey, I don't want manufacturing users from Dallas to reach finance users in New York. Okay? But whenever that happens, tell me. And in this case, it's going to tell you that this is how the traffic is flowing. Okay? And again, I can go through the path inspector, and I know I have a firewall in New York that should have blocked it. Okay, So I can go to that firewall, and I can look at the access list data and say, wow, this access list has a destination any. It's opening up the hole too much. Okay, It should not have opened up the hole that much. So if I narrow down this access list, I can protect myself against this. Now, there was one question. That uh, I so want you to can highlight actually from. show the entry in the access list that's permitting the or dropping the traffic. Exactly. Hmm. Yes. I mean, that's, that's the idea is that you yeah. know your network really well. If we can kind of show you exactly, you know, you'll say, oh, I remember. You'll make the change, rerun, and we're good. Yeah. Well, actually, the response would be, which idiot put it there? But <laughs> 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 OK, so uh, that's like finding needle in the haystack. If, if an operations engineer had to do that, he'll take weeks to find that problem. And by the way, there was a question earlier. Uh, how do we make our system more service aware? How do we know what's going on in the network and define these, even these policies automatically? I'll give you an example from banking industry. Let's say a large bank has 5,000 ATMs across the country. They want to know whether these ATMs are always connected to the core banking system or not. There is an ATM controller out there that knows about all the ATMs. Whenever the bank adds 10 new ATMs, the controller knows about it. So with one of the financial organizations we're working with, we're integrating with their ATM controller. The ATM controller tells us what all the ATMs are and which core banking system they should be connected to. and we will. Through integration, automatically add those ATMs as those ATMs get added across the country. And the system will check for that. Same examples I can give you in the federal government, in healthcare industry, in service providers, where we can integrate with these other systems and automatically generate intents. Okay. Um, one last thing that I will tell you, which the search that I did earlier, 
and this is related to the disaster uh, recovery uh, example that I was giving you. The same IP DST uh, destination search that I did earlier. Okay. Remember, in the previous snapshot, this path was going through the primary ISP. Now it's going through the backup ISP, the, the redundant ISP. You can actually do these kinds of checks to see is my redundancy even working or not. You know, so that and and these. I've done this through search. You can save these searches as policies, so they are automatically checked. So you will always know which path is being taken for any given service. And the same thing can be used. Let's say a security guy walks into the network engineer's office and says, hey, there is a machine under attack. Can you quickly block it? Well, the network engineer will have to find out what are all the possible paths for this hacker to get to that machine. This search will give him all that possible path. And he can say, OK, I know there are these two firewalls along the way that I need to block. Not one firewall, but two. Because if he blocks one, he's going to miss it. Okay? So this will give him the full picture. He can go quickly block those access lists. And with the pre-flight, Brighton is going to show. He can actually verify ahead of time whether those ACLs will work or not. OK, uh, please, any questions? Why do you have ECMP only at the top of that graph? And, and nowhere else? And also, why the long path with the east-west link there? Uh, so basically, it, this is not using ECMP. This is using all possible spanning tree uh, paths. OK. Yes, this is layer two. These two I are, see. Yeah, these two are HSRP gateways. Now, here is what our system. It checks for all possible behavior, even spoofed packet that a hacker might generate. So a hacker might generate a packet, as the example was earlier. It, somebody doesn't have to put a static route for that. A hacker can generate a packet that says, go to this IP address, but use this different MAC address. Okay. So when that happens, traffic may follow. In layer two, traffic may follow a different path. So we are showing you all those possible paths. Got it. Okay. Yes, please. So you showed a picture earlier going to the other ISP. Yes. Why aren't both of those? active at the same time? Uh, because in this network, I have made sure using metric that my ISP1 is preferred as an intent. Well, you also said we're showing all possible paths. So yes, simply yes. based on a metric, I should see two paths, shouldn't I? So that second path or is more of, in the routing the value table. of all possible. <laughs> <laughs> that, that second path is not in the routing table yet because the metric is different. Once it gets to the routing table, we'll see it. So all it's, ECMP paths. It all isn't your IGP. So we will, it's so just not the best you, paths. Right. So, right. so let me tell you all the all paths, paths we will see. We will see all the ICMP paths. We'll see all the HSRP paths. Mm -hmm. Those are there in the protocol state. The paths which have less metric, they don't show up okay. in the routing table yet. When they show up, we'll see it. Yes. So yes. how do you test resiliency? You really need to look into particular routing protocol. It's not the best route, it's next best. But if best route goes away, you're going to use the next one. So if you're verifying resiliency, you really need to see whether next one mm -hmm. is available. Absolutely, I, I agree. There are many levels of resiliency that are put in mm -hmm. place. Many of those checks we have already in place. So there's spanning tree resilience, HSRP resilience, mm -hmm. there is uh, ECMP resilience, there is this secondary path through metric control. So all of those can be put in place in our system. Many of them we have already implemented, and there's more that keeps coming as we mature. Okay, so it's not implemented yet, but it's coming. Finding different paths which are not in routing table yet, yes, that's coming. Okay, can you show us how intents are defined? How do I write down uh, an okay, intent? Great. Thank Does you, it? good question. So um, stop this search. You know the segmentation intent that I showed you? This is our uh, policy library in which many of the intents are predefined based upon industry best practices. You can configure them. Uh, there's a long list of intents in availability, resilience, and segmentation category. The one intent that I wanted to show you um, is uh, segmentation. And that is this one. Oh, by the way, this is like, imagine you have these, in, these intents in your head. Yeah. I want to now translate that into the network. This is where you right. would do it. Yeah, this is where you would do it. So all this is saying is the source segment is the Dallas manufacturing devices, and destination segment is the New York uh, finance devices. 
And by the way, a customer had a spreadsheet with devices and with his own definition of what these zones should be. We integrated that, and all of those zones automatically show up. Otherwise, you can manually define them. I don't so see TCP UDP ports there. Can I define even the single port, or is it just network to network? Yes, you can define ports, you can define VLAN, you can define, it should enter a specific okay. port. Uh, sorry, just one thought here. These can be con ATMs that get integrated and populated automatically through an API from the ATM controller. Or user can just come here and type it in. Yes. Yeah, I think that is the most important part, part because I start with all the intents of my network. It is the most important par part of the design because uh, that's what I need to validate. Absolutely. So it, it should be easy to write it down via API, via import, via a table, an Excel or something, yeah. and import everything. Because I, I understand automatic intents are useful, but this is my network, I understand my business, uh, so I translate my business uh, to a list of like uh, a thousand intents, uh, and these are the ones that must be running. All of that is possible. Okay. So you've templated number of most common intents. Yes. Uh, is there a machine-to-machine -machine interface to program those intents? Is there a way to generate, auto-generate classes in uh, Java or Python to program those intents directly from business logic rather than typing them manually? Absolutely. That's what I was telling you earlier. We can integrate with like an ATM controller or if you have any other business logic software, we can integrate with that, which can uh, program these intents. And if something is not in the pre-canned intent library, you can use searches and convert your search into an intent. Oh. Would it auto-generate API and binding code, or I would need to do this myself? Well, I think initially you will need to know exactly what you want to do, so you may have to try it. But after that, you can script it so it's auto-generated, yes. So we're talking about like segments or VLANs or whatever. Can we have arbitrary uh, definitions based on DNS name or something like that to say, hey, I want any server that has .web in my FQDN to be in this group, and that way I can say my intent for all of my web services is blah. Absolutely, okay. you can do that. And you can use them, once you do that, then you can group them and say this is my web server region. Okay. And then you can apply policies to that entire region, not to individual devices. Okay. Can it get this information from like a vCenter, VMware vCenter? Like so I have we virtual have. machine with this tag. I don't know which, which IP they will get, but I know that v, uh, virtual machine with this tag will be a web server, so it should reach all these uh, databases. It can. Okay. Uh, we have integrated in different customer environments with different software already but it can also be integrated with vCenter. I know we have done integration with HPNA and with many other uh, management tools. Uh, so, and vCenter is actually good because they have pretty good uh, yeah. APIs available, so we can integrate with that. So did I understand right that there's the ability to, to group devices according to other characteristics like DNS name or device name or maybe even tags associated with those devices and then yes. use use those tags, I'll use the word tags here, use those tags for helping automate the application of policies or intent. Absolutely. Okay. Yes. You can also group if it's a, for a service provider and you're managing separate customers, you can then group and tag for those customers as well and visualize. Yes. Oh, so you support uh, overlapping address spaces as well? Well, that's, uh, I mean, it depends what you're learning, but if you're overlapping. <laughs> Sorry, I just jumped ahead here. Yeah. Like, okay, multiple yeah. customers of more overlapping address space. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but we have, we, we have. <laughs> I got a deer in the headlights, look. <laughs> is, it, is, yeah, is it VRF aware? We, we're working with service providers which have multi-tenants. Okay. Overlapping address space, yes. Sorry, go ahead. There's a question. Yeah, it was the same, if uh, it supports the VRF. Yes, it supports VRF. Absolutely. So can, can I query in my search a, a specific VRF? Absolutely. You, you, you can say, hey, I want to go from here to here, and it must pass this VRF. Yes. OK. Um, device names. You can use device names. You can use, so like, let's say you receive an advisory from uh, Palo Alto that says, hey, uh, all your Palo Alto devices need to be upgraded. If it's a large network, you want to know where all those devices are. You mm -hmm. can just do a search. Tell me all Palo Alto devices with this OS version. It'll highlight them on the on the chart, and then you can just 
you know, act on that information. The, okay. Okay, I want to find all devices that have a blade of a certain software rev or hardware rev. Absolutely, you can okay. do that. We, we capture the uh, software and hardware version of not just devices, but also sub-devices. Mm -hmm. Whether those are line cards in the device or those are right. flexes out uh, of the device. Yes. Mm -hmm. okay, can I collect data from security intelligence feed to see if uh, a traffic matching a particular attack or something uh, will be allowed in my network? So again, that integration is possible. Uh, and, and you can integrate with uh, not just the threat sources of traffic, but also threat sources of attack types. Yeah. Yes, all of that is possible. Are you looking at configuring devices as well? Not today, although we have done that for a, a specific federal customer, which is essentially you're talking about a feedback yes. loop. That, hey, I found a problem, now I want to go back and fix the problem. Today we are leaving that to the expert hands of network engineers to decide what is their best approach to solve the problem. However, based upon the knowledge, we also know what best approaches are. And with one customer, he said, can, can I send in a command to, to stop a port, like to shut down a port? And we did that for one of the federal customers.